So let me get this straight. We have an electronics control module over here and a camera over there. We just get a pair of Maxim serializers and deserializers, hook up the serializer to the camera, hook up the deserializer to the control module, connect the serializer to the deserializer with a hank of good quality coax, and all that beautiful, luscious video just starts pouring in, right? <laughs> well, no, not really. That camera looks really simple, but it's actually a sophisticated piece of technology that needs just a little care and feeding to get running and stay running. And the serializer itself has a lot of modes and functions, and it needs to be properly configured before it's ready to assume its duties. So, how do you configure the camera and the serializer when they're so far away from the control module? Well, an obvious choice would be to put a microcontroller out at the remote side with firmware that would configure the camera and the serializer. After all, Maxim makes lots of very capable and inexpensive micros that would serve the purpose well. But here's the thing. A microcontroller represents additional expense, design time, and firmware development. And if you have to update the firmware, what? Plug a laptop into the camera module? Look, besides, I thought the idea here was to reduce the complexity of the system. GMSL has a solution, a control channel that operates in parallel with a main video channel. Settle in and I'll tell you how it works. First, just one word of explanation. What I'm describing today applies to Maxim's original GMSL devices that we refer to as GMSL1. Newer devices using GMSL2 and later technology also have a control channel, but it works quite a bit differently than what I'm about to describe here, and we'll cover GMSL2 in another episode. The main video channel in a GMSL connection is bit scrambled and encoded so that the signal that appears on the wire has no DC or low frequency content and has a high density of fast signal transitions. GMSL was designed this way so that it can operate over an AC coupled connection and the receiver can establish its own logic levels and recover the bit clock. But all that scrambling and coding has the happy side effect of confining the signal bandwidth to a region from about F over 2 down to about F over 40. That means there's room below the primary bearer channel to sneak in a control channel in the reverse direction from the deserializer back to the serializer. Control information in the forward direction from the serializer to the deserializer can be embedded directly in the main data channel. The practical effect of this is that GMSL provides not just high speed data for video, but lower speed bi directional data for control and monitoring. Now understand, when I say lower speed, I don't mean low speed, I mean up to about 1 megabit per second. You're not going to be streaming movies over that link, but for configuration and status, it's just the ticket. To start, let's assume that the camera and its associated serializer are at the remote end of the connection with no attached microcontroller, and that the deserializer is connected to the host processor. How do we even get started? Well, when a serializer or a deserializer powers up, it reads the state of certain pins that configure the serial link to a known, agreed-upon state. That means, within a few milliseconds of power being applied, the deserializer should begin seeing a usable signal on its serial inputs. Once the deserializer is synchronized to the video stream from the serializer, the fun can begin. The control module needs to configure first the deserializer, then the serializer, and finally, the camera. It can do this over a single connection, most frequently an I2C connection, but possibly over a serial port. Let me say that again. The control module configures the deserializer, the serializer, and the camera over a single serial connection. How? Well, to understand how we can effectively extend an I2C bus from the control unit all the way to the camera, we need to understand just a little bit about I2C itself. 
Most I2C buses have a single master and one or more slaves. The master generates the clock, usually standard mode at 100 kilohertz or fast mode at 400 kilohertz. The master also initiates and concludes all transactions on the bus. But what you may not know is that the addressed slave can pull the clock low as well. It's a technique called clock stretching and it's critical to making the remote I2C facilities in GMSL work. Here's how clock stretching works. If the master is writing to a slave, it sends one byte at a time and expects an acknowledge bit after every byte. But if the slave needs more time to process the data, after SCL falls following the last data bit, the slave can begin to drive SCL low. When the master tries to release SCL, it sees that it's still being held low, and so the master suspends its own operation until the slave releases SCL, indicating that it's ready for more data. And it works for read operations too. If the slave needs more time to obtain data, it can hold down SCL following the read bit. When it has the data, it first places the first bit on SDA and then releases SCL, and the master patiently waits until SCL goes high to continue clocking in the data. Now, you're going to ask, what does all this have to do with GMSL? Just this. GMSL effectively extends the I2C bus from the local device, in this case the deserializer, to the remote device, the serializer. Further, the serializer can extend the I2C bus to connected slave devices. If the host sends a message on the I2C bus for the local device, well, then fine. The local device handles the message and all is well. But if the message is for the remote device or for an I2C slave attached to the remote device, well, then the local device transparently passes the message along the reverse control channel to the remote device. The host may see some latency, and it may have its clock stretched a little, but otherwise the transaction will look just like it came from a device attached to the local bus. With clock stretching, the timing on an I2C bus becomes really flexible, but not all I2C masters support clock stretching. You'll need to check with your microcontroller vendor to make sure your I2C master supports that mode of operation. Most devices of more than rudimentary complexity support configuration and status operations by exposing a set of register. Each register occupies an address in some defined address space. I2C devices are no different. To configure and read most devices that reside on an I2C bus, you must first identify the device, then provide a register address. And only then can you read data from or write data to the addressed register in the device. It's a process that's been around for years. If you're writing to an I2C device that exposes a set of registers, you send a start signal, then the 7-bit device ID, a write bit, then the register address, then the register data, getting an ACK bit for each byte of data that you send, and finally, you send a stop signal at the end to conclude the transaction. If you're reading from a register-based I2C device, you send a start signal, the 7-bit device ID, a write bit, and the register address. Then you send a repeated start signal, the device ID again, this time a read bit, and then the slave begins sending register data starting at the designated address with the master providing an ACK after each byte. After all the desired data has been received, the master provides a stop signal. Now I bring all this up because we're about to look at interfacing the host to the local device over a UART channel. You may choose to do this because your I2C master doesn't support clock stretching. Maybe your micro doesn't have an I2C interface at all. Or maybe you just prefer to use a UART. And, you know, that's fine. But we need to map what you're sending over the UART onto the concepts that we just discussed. A device ID, read-write bits, register addresses that we associate with I2C. 
We do that with a serial protocol, and here's how it works. First, the ground rules. Depending on the particular device you choose, there will be a minimum bit rate, some as low as 9600, others need to be no less than about 100 kilobits per second. The maximum data rate is 1 megabit per second. The serial link presented to the host uses 8 data bits, even parity, and 1 stop bit. Those are the preliminaries. Now let's see how a serial message over a UART maps to an I2C message. Every message over the serial port from the host to the local device begins with a sync character, hex 79. The next byte contains the device address in bit 7 down to 1 and the read write bit in bit 0, a 1 for a read command and a 0 for a write command exactly like I2C. The next byte identifies the register address to be read or written, followed by a count of the data bytes. Let's say that the command is a write command. After the byte count is sent, the host sends exactly the number of bytes indicated in the byte count. The local device accepts those bytes and loads them into registers one after another, incrementing the register address after each write. When it's done, the local device sends an ACK byte, hex C3, back to the host. Note that the new values don't take effect until the device sends the ACK. So, if the serial parameters, like the baud rate perhaps, have changed, the host can use the old parameters to receive the ACK and then switch to the new values. What if the command was a read? Then the local device sends an ACK byte, hex C3, immediately after it gets the number of bytes to read. It then begins reading the requested registers and sends them, one at a time, to the host. When it's sent the requested number of bytes, that's it, it's done, and it's ready for the next command. So now the host has configured the deserializer over the local connection. It uses the exact same method to configure the serializer at the other end of the coax. As soon as the local device sees that it's not the address device, it forwards the message over the reverse channel to the remote device. The local device acts like a middleman, and the only difference is a little additional latency. All right, now the host is ready to configure the camera. But the camera has an I2C interface for control and not a serial interface, so how does that work? Well, this is where the similarities between the structure of an I2C frame and the serial protocol packet used by GMSL come in. Because the fields of the serial protocol line up so nicely with an I2C frame, and since the I2C bit rate is the same as the serial baud rate, translating between the two worlds is actually kind of easy. When the remote device, the serializer in this case, receives a packet that contains an address that isn't its own, it commands its I2C master to initiate a start sequence and begins transmitting the contents of the packet. First, it sends the 7-bit device address plus the write bit. Next comes the register address. After that, the serializer skips the length byte, but when it starts getting the data bytes, it transfers however many bytes were indicated in the length field. You can see that with the exception of the length field, it's almost copying data directly from the serial interface to the I2C master, and the only real difference is the way acknowledgments are handled. If the command was a write, then the I2C master expects to get an ACK after each byte, and once all bytes have been ACKed, then the I2C master can send a single ACK character back to the deserializer and then from there on back to the host. If the command was a read, the serializer can send an ACK character back to the host as soon as it receives an ACK bit from the peripheral following the repeated start and device ID sequence. The remote device then begins reading the peripheral one byte at a time. The I2C master sends an ACK sequence to the peripheral for each byte as it's received, 
and then sends the data along to the deserializer. And when it's done, it's done. It sends the stop sequence to the peripheral, and that's it. So now you can see how the control unit, using either I2C or a UART connection, can configure the deserializer and the serializer and the camera module without needing a microcontroller at the remote end of the connection. But what I haven't explained yet is that this doesn't just work when the deserializer connects to the host computer. You can control the connection from the serializer as well using the forward control channel to configure the deserializer. This is ideal if you're trying to configure, let's say, a display on a remote connection. Further, the control connection to the peripheral device doesn't have to be an I2C connection at all. It can be a serial to serial connection if needed, and in fact, you can run the serial link in bypass mode. In bypass mode, the local device connected to the host doesn't even attempt to interpret the incoming characters. It just passes them along to the destination as is. Bypass mode is selected on an external pin, so you can restore normal operation by just changing the state of the mode select pin. The lesson to take away is that whatever is on the other side of the cable, you can configure, control, and monitor its operation from the control module without having to put intelligence in the remote device. That's how Maxim innovates high-speed serial communications. Stay tuned to learn more about Maxim's GMSL high-speed serial interfaces.